I now finally feel like I'm in a, in a point in my career where it's paying off and I'm just doing the things I want to do. And I definitely put in the work and now I'm reaping the rewards of that work. I got a message about today's guest from Krista Copper, who catalogs and archives everything we talk about here on the podcast and also has her own podcast, The Backstage Creative. And she let me know about today's guest, and she seemed like such an interesting person and doing all sorts of different things in the music world. We connected with today's guest. She did not disappoint. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are talking today with Eleanor Oppenheim, who just wrapped up a long stint as the bassist for the Broadway revival of Oklahoma. She also, she describes herself on her website, Eleanor does, as a genre surfing musical polyglot, which is a great way, way to describe what she does. We talk about her musical background, studying with people like Oren O'Brien and Don Palma, the challenges of the music school environment hitting the audition trail, which she did for quite some time, what it was like leaving that and getting into her own projects like her 2016 album Home and what she's done since then, her current project, The Hands Free, and much more. I had a blast, hopefully the first of many conversations with Eleanor. And a quick shout out to our sponsors, Steve Swan String Bass, D'Addario Strings, The Bass Violin Shop, Upton Bass, Modacity, Colstein Music, and A440 Violin Shop. More on them later, but let's get into this conversation with Eleanor and also feature a little bit of music from her album Home. in Westchester County? No, I grew up in New York City. Oh, you grew up in New York City. Wow. Yeah. Like the city city, like uh, Manhattan. Like the city, like Manhattan. Really? I was born in Brooklyn, but uh, mostly grew up in Manhattan. Wow. In Hell's Kitchen. Well, really? Okay. That's like the opposite of my upbringing in <laughs> South Dakota. It kind of sounds <laughs> like it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Ed, you've lived other places, at least for a bit, going to Yale yeah. um, and traveled and stuff. So, like, I mean, it's hard to, like, kind of, like, what's it like growing up in New York City? I can't even imagine what that, I can't even imagine what's it like, what it's like growing up here in San Francisco. And New York is like, you know, four, four levels beyond that in terms of that urban experience, I bet. What what was that like? Uh, or maybe compared to, like, the 90 eight percent of people who didn't grow up in a place that that uh, metropolitan well i mean it, it's a great place to grow up you have access to all all the major cultural institutions and when you're a student a lot of stuff is free or cheap um and you know uh field trips <laughs> at school are <laughs> certainly interesting although a lot of our field trips were like hey, let's get the kids out of the city and do stuff like go up the Hudson River and go seining. Because oh. it's like, you know, for city kids, we don't know anything about the state that we live in. Because yeah. <laughs> when you grow up in New York City, it's like so self-contained. Mm -hmm. And our our education was sort of like trying to get us out of the city and okay. show us like what New York State looks like a lot. <laughs> But yeah, you know, I I feel very fortunate to have grown up there, and now I feel very fortunate not to live in the city. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Is it? Yeah, the 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 level of energy, and you know, there are other big cities in the country, but there's nothing like New York City. That's that's a special kind of exciting energy. But it's uh, the the pace of life is pretty different from just about anywhere else I've ever been. Yeah, it's great. I mean, if you're a creative person, uh, it it feeds you and it you know the city gives you everything you need to be a, an artist 
except for now it doesn't give you affordable housing or a good quality of life for the amount of money that you make as an artist so a lot of artists have moved out of the city because it's just not a sustainable place to live anymore unfortunately yeah it's uh, it's it's unfortunate and you're talking to someone who lives in san francisco proper so yeah. i'm all all two i'm like the only bass player <laughs> living in san francisco you know there may be a couple others but it's it's everybody's gone to oakland and now even oakland's getting expensive and and this is totally left field, but Moby, you know, you know, the artist Moby, he wrote this yeah. great article maybe five or five years ago about why he was moving from New York City, where he lived for forever, to Los Angeles. And it was a really, it was something that really made me think because he was talking about how the stakes are so high if you're living in New York City. Like there's no, there's no margin for experimentation or failure. Like if your project flops, you're, you're not going to pay rent that next month. And that loss, yeah. loss. Los Angeles is like a city, it's probably a city of failure is the wrong word, but like a place that's in that world where, you know, every third movie project you do is a flop or maybe every other one. And even the mayor is like a, an amateur jazz or failed jazz pianist. He was just saying that <laughs> if you're, if you're in Los Angeles, the worst thing that'll happen is you end up in West Hollywood or whichever is the bad Hollywood. So I did, did you ever check that out? That piece? Um, you know, I remember when that came out, and of course, it, there was a kerfuffle around <laughs> it because New Yorkers are so, you know, we have such a weird hang up about LA. Yeah. A lot of us. Right. Not me. Again, <laughs> I will clarify I love LA. I love Southern and Northern California. I'm happy about your state in general, and I also have a lot of family there. Oh, that's but, cool. But uh, I do remember when it came out. And it's always sort of a controversy when someone moves out of the city. Mm -hmm. There's this whole phenomenon on social media of people sort of writing these extremely long and explicative, like Facebook posts about, you know, feeling like they have to defend their reasoning for like leaving the city to everyone they know. And it's this, it's this <laughs> whole weird culture about leaving the city where it's like, if you leave, you're a failure. I just, I don't buy into any of that. Maybe it's because I'm from New York I just I don't I think you should live where you, where you can live and you don't have to defend yourself and if you're doing what you're doing and you're able to do it then you can stay and if not don't worry about it so much yeah that social pressure and the hype <laughs> of the city and that sort of thing is like it's that's such a that's such a fascinating thing to watch um did when did you move out of the city uh three years ago okay and I actually, it's a bit of an extreme case, but I live on the campus of a boarding school. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a very different uh, environment is, the city. How is that for you uh, creatively? Because I know you write and you do all sorts of, you get, you're, you're involved in all sorts of cool projects. Like, how um, how has that changed maybe the creative side of you? Uh, just maybe having a little more space or just a different pace of life. Do you Has it changed the way you think about uh composition or performing or any, anything along those lines it has um one thing i noticed when i'm i i i love um the concept of time in in music and art in general and how that is you know so inherently um uh, the concept of time in art is a thing that is entirely subjective. Mm -hmm. um, but what I noticed is that when I'm, when I had more time and space to make things, the things that I were, that I was making were breathing more. Uh -huh. uh, and they were, I was able to kind of um, express this <laughs> part of my creative identity that I, I think I hadn't been able to before because I just didn't have the time and space. I didn't, you know, feel like I had it. Even when I maybe did have the time, I just, the, the energy of the city kind of made me write a certain way, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Oh yeah, for sure. And now I, you know, I'm at heart, I, I'm a, a nature person. I'm not really a city person, even though I grew up in the city. It's, it's weird to say that, but I would much rather be in the middle of the woods on a mountain, like any day of the week. And the kind of music that I have been writing since I moved is like, you know, woods on a mountain music instead mm. of city music. 
if that makes sense. But oh, I'm still influenced by all of the things that I had access to, you know, growing up in the city. So I guess it's it's a sort of a, a mixture of things, but I, I feel like I can I can write more spaciously now. Yeah, I get. I I just had a conversation for the podcast uh, a little earlier this morning with a, an Italian bass player named Sebastiano Denisai, who did this project uh, where he he's from Sardinia, you know, just off the coast mm. of Italy, and and he decided to take over a year and buy bicycle between every single town on Sardinia. There are three hundred and seventy seven towns a lot of them are like a hundred people or something like that and it took 14 months and he brought along his bass ukulele and at the end of every day he sat down and he he plugged in to, to record and he wrote out and recorded something just based on his experience of that day and also photographed and travel log and it's just like and and talk about changing your perspective artistically um and it's just so interesting to to see what he wrote and to just talking today he's that's going to eventually morph into an album and so like again i think of things that are like the opposite of probably New York city or my San Francisco life. I just, I love, I love people who find a way to get a little more margin in their life. Uh, artistically. I, I got to meet this guy. Oh, yeah. I I'll love send, that. I'll idea. send you a link to his. It's, it's like, he's like, it's like the sort of thing I, I fantasize about every once in a while. I was like, Oh, I want to leave it all and get on a bike and, you know, bike to Seattle and back. And, and his is like, you know, levels beyond that, but yeah, really interesting. And so he's writing a travel book about his experiences. Of course, the local government, of Sardinia is, is very pleased that he did this. He's like a poster child for tourism in Sardinia. So he's working with yeah. them on some level for that. And then he's got this whole, whole music that I'm sure never would have uh, manifested itself if he hadn't taken himself out of the city. And he said he was uh, deliberately just trying to have one-on-one -on -one contact, contact with humans, you know, and, and a place like that, it's like going back in time, you know, everything looks like it's 1984 or something like that. Yeah. Well, and they have that amazing vocal tradition in Sardinia too. It's <sighs> a, a very music saturated uh, island for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so when, so, so bass, uh, sorry, go, yes. go, but I, there, there, there's no, there's, there's no structure to these. So that's just, a, but, um, no, uh, when, when did that come into your life? Uh, was that your first instrument or did that? Did no. that okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I begged, my parents are jazz musicians, uh, actually. And, uh, they never, they kind of the opposite of pushed me into music <laughs> they tried to push me out of music mm -hmm. based on their own experiences they didn't want to visit that upon me <laughs> shall we say sure. um and i had to beg i begged for violin lessons for like an entire year starting when i was i think like three or three or four um mm. as soon as i knew what what music was i remember listening to the my dad always used to put on the classical station in the car and so we would always listen to classical music in the car. And from a very early age, I wanted to, I was drawn to that and I wanted to play violin. Mm. And, um, you know, they kept saying, you know, if you still want it in like a year, then we'll, we'll start you on lessons, but you need to really think about it. I, I can't imagine saying that to a four year old myself, <laughs> <laughs> right. but they did. And after, after a year they relented and I started Suzuki violin and then I didn't love playing violin. It was a little screechy for me. So I, I switched to cello when we moved back to the city. We had been living sort of all over the place uh, until I was six and we moved back to Manhattan and uh, I started cello. And then the reason I switched to bass in junior high school was that I decided I wanted to play jazz and I didn't think cello was the right tool for that for me. Mm. And I kind of realized that if you played bass, you could pretty much play any kind of music you want because bass is in everything. And so that appealed to me. Bass players tend to look for bows in slightly different ways than other string players. Here's A440's Michael Spadero on what he's observed with bassists looking for bows. Here's one thing I've noticed over the years. Uh, violinists and, and cellists tend to gravitate toward more expensive bows. And with bass players, 
I give them as little information as possible, and a lot of times they'll end up selecting a $200 bow mm -hmm. that feels great mm -hmm. to them and works really well with their instrument. Learn more about the selection of bows and bases and everything else online at a440violinshop.com, and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Our friends at D'Addario want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. When you pull the string through the peg, twist it around itself a few times before continuing to wind. This pulls more of the string through the peg neatly, and it decreases the likelihood of the string falling out of tension. Learn more at orchestral.dedario.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass, which is home to the largest collection of double basses on the West Coast between Los Angeles and Canada. That's a lot of miles, folks. Steve's showroom is outstanding absolutely worth a visit. It's located just south of San Francisco Airport, SFO, and he has about 70 bases on display. And these bases range from student entry-level instruments all the way to the finest professional instruments. I've sent so many students and referred so many people to Steve's shop. He really does great work. And if you're looking for a base, you're going to find one that suits your needs your playing needs and your budgetary needs for sure. Steve Swan at stringbase.com is where you can go. And thank you, Steve, for sponsoring the podcast. And uh, so I switched to bass uh, in junior high school. It was like maybe seventh grade, mm -hmm. something like that. Do you play a lot of jazz these days or have you like in the last, you know, chunk of years? Um, I do play some jazz. I wouldn't say that it's a, a major facet of my creative life, but I've always maintained that aspect of my of my playing and my musical identity, you could say. How how did you get into how did the solo bass bug bite you? Like how did that um cuz I think it's very interesting what you're doing. I like in in preparation I watched uh, uh, what I could find of you on YouTube including this pretty cool talk from Stony Brook like quite a while ago, like 2013 or something about that solo my, bass. Yeah, that was that was part of my doctoral degree. <laughs> oh, okay. So when mm -hmm. when the, in the in your journey did you start to uh get excited about the bass as a solo instrument or kind of doing what you're maybe what you're doing on on home or other projects pretty early on yeah. i always i always thought that the bass had so much more potential than people allowed it as a solo instrument um and i have never been one for pigeonholing uh -huh. <laughs> or putting things in boxes and i remember from a pretty early part of my studies on the bass, sort of announcing to Oren, who was my teacher, <laughs> that I wanted to be a solo bassist. And she kind of <laughs> cocked her head and looked at me <laughs> askance and was like, well, let's just make sure you get really good technique and then we'll take it from there. <laughs> um, she was, she's always very practical. Sure. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I, I always wanted to do that. Um, and I never really thought it would be possible to do exactly what I wanted musically until I was in grad school. I sort of kept taking orchestra auditions because that was what you did mm -hmm. at the time. And I just kind of hated it. And I hated preparing excerpts in a vacuum. I just feel like that sucks the, the creativity out of it. It sucks the music out of it in a way that I, I just really didn't enjoy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love playing in an orchestra and I love that experience and I still do that a, a fair amount, but I didn't love the audition process and I didn't love the preparation for auditions. And eventually Don kind of looked at me in a lesson one day and was like, you really don't want to be doing this, do you? <laughs> I was like, no, I don't. And he was like, well, what are you afraid of? Why don't you just do what you want to do? And that was sort of, it seemed, it seems obvious, but sometimes you just need someone to validate whatever it is, whatever freaky thing you want to do and tell you that if you you know, are good enough. And if you hustle and work really hard, that eventually that thing will become the thing that, you know, that'll 
set you apart from other people and help you have a career. Wow. So you you were on that audition taking path and and doing that. So, so uh, Juilliard was your undergrad, right? Am I yeah. correct? Okay. So yeah. studying with Oren, Oren O'Brien, uh, who is great. I had one, a wonderful, like, it was like a three-hour podcast with her or something <laughs> a couple, right. couple, couple years ago. <laughs> and it was fantastic. And then, um, and then Don Palma at Yale – uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so what did you, um, cause I, I, and many other people who listen to this, not everybody certainly, but you know, I probably took 30 orchestra auditions, uh, 24 of which were probably totally, uh, unsuccessful <laughs> and, you know, $18,000 later or more, uh, I, I got off that path too. But, um, what, after that conversation with Don or like around then, what would you start to do differently? Did you just say forget it no more orchestra auditions or yep. really okay okay wow yeah I, I think i had taken like three or four mm -hmm. and i was just really miserable sure <laughs> it's like just don't do anymore what's wrong with you and i was like oh okay and so i didn't and that was the end of that i think the last one i took was maybe like minnesota and I like, I, you know, I did the whole thing. I flew there and it was like winter time and it sucked and it was, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I just was by, I was like alone in my hotel room to sort of like, oh, what am I doing? And then I came <laughs> home and Don was like, just don't do it. So thank yeah. you, Don. Well, it's, fu it's funny. It's something I think about a lot because they're, they're like these, we, I doubt that anybody picked up the double bass or the violin or whatever to uh, treat it like an uh, Olympic sport. But that's what audition yeah. taking very much is the training and the preparation and the competition. And it's so, um, not that everybody should stop taking orchestra auditions. That's not what I'm saying. But like, it's, it's so against the spirit of the creative artist <laughs> in so many ways, you know? And so yeah. like, and now I look at what you're doing and, uh, and uh, at least the, the projects are highlighting on the website. And that's just, it's just like bursting with creativity and what you're doing on the base. And it's, it's, it's so, those are like, so feel so opposed to me uh, that like, like, I think most people probably want to go into music for creativity and then they end up doing this thing that actually creativity is a liability. And then if you are fortunate enough to get into one of those orchestras, being creative in the bass section isn't really what you do. Um, it's not rewarded. <laughs> we'll put it that way. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, like they, they, I don't get called back if I get creative with my articulation or my vibrato or, or whatever. Yeah. So it's um, – so what was that like? Okay, so uh, so did you – had you been – since you have a jazz background too, I mean, had you been writing? Had you been doing other things on the side or – I have always been doing all the things that I do. Cool. And my okay. biggest advice to people, to musicians in general, regardless of what your voice or instrument or how you express yourself – if there are things that you're enjoying doing, you should always continue doing them, even if you think they won't pay or they mm -hmm. won't, you know, mm -hmm. you know, people won't appreciate them because that is what, those are the things that make it possible for you to keep going and do the things you don't enjoy doing occasionally. I, you know, at this point I have put in a lot of blood, sweat, <laughs> tears, many years of just being poor and miserable and it's, you know, I now finally feel like I'm in a, in a point in my career where it's paying off and I'm just doing the things I want to do. And I definitely put in the work and now I'm reaping the rewards of that work. And so all the projects that I'm doing now are things I want to be doing, which is such a great feeling to have as an artist, you know, I'm like totally fulfilled in my creative life and it's paying me money. So, you know, you will probably go through periods of having to do a bunch of stuff you don't want to do, but knowing like knowing how to have the right balance of those things is always key. And I've always done, I've always written music. I've always played a lot of different styles of music. I've always was playing in rock bands and playing jazz and classical music and, um, folk music and I you know I don't just play bass either I play some other instruments just for fun and I sing and you know I always was doing that stuff and I think that's important because that's 
a what makes me a sort of a valuable commodity if you want to look at it that way mm -hmm. uh it, because i have these disparate skill sets but also it's what sustained me through the years of like you know stultifying poverty and depression that everyone goes through in New York as an artist. <laughs> was there ever a low point for you in these years, you know, like, like for maybe from grad school or whenever till now, did you ever have, like, I certainly can think of a few low points for me, you know, financially oh, yeah. creative dissatisfaction or whatever. What, what, what are some of those maybe that you, that you'd feel comfortable sharing and how, how'd you work through that? So, yeah, I think we all have those and it's important to have them because they're instructive and they teach us which things to let go of. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had a few low points. You know, one of my biggest low points was actually in undergrad when I realized about halfway through Juilliard that it just really wasn't the right environment for me. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I... I stayed for Oren because I just, I love Oren and she was the right teacher for me at that point. Um, but every other aspect of, of that, uh, that experience was sort of not quite the right fit for me. So that was definitely a low point. And then another low point I would say uh, was the period like maybe a year or so before we decided to move out of the city. Um, when I was, you know, just working my butt off and barely making it and just had like sort of a crisis of faith, which I think is normal. Mm -hmm. And then kind of we decided to move out of the city and everything fell into place from there. Um, and I'm not saying people should move out of the city. But what <laughs> I'm saying is that for me, one major life-changing decision was a catalyst for all of these other positive smaller and larger changes in my life and so being able to step back and look at the macro picture periodically i think is important and and again not, i can't stress this enough figuring out which things to let go of and which things not to let go of. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the key right there, isn't it? It's amazing what what happens when you let go of the things that you should have left let go of maybe a long time ago. Yeah, like you know, like you were saying about letting go of the audition process for you mm -hmm. and for me. You know, that's a that's a that's a hard thing to do because when you spend your entire musical life with somebody telling you the only way you're going to uh, be able to make ends meet is to get an orchestra job. That's a, t a type of conditioning that it takes a while to kind of break out of. And you have that sunk cost, uh, you know, fallacy kind of built in there where you think you've, you've invested so much time, so much money, and then you, t you, you know, a, a so many years and you can't let this all be for nothing. But that's, you know, that's a, a dangerous line of reasoning to go down for anything, but certainly for a, a creative person. Yeah. And it wasn't for nothing. Right. That's the important thing to remember, because it was for getting the experience and then deciding that that's not the experience you wanted. Mm -hmm. So that's the opposite of nothing. That's everything. That's, you know, helping you make the most important decision of your career, essentially. So in that sense, the amount of money and time that you invested was sort of minuscule compared to the enormity of the decision that it helped you to make, yeah. if that makes sense sense oh yeah absolutely um i was i was listening through uh home and uh which which is super cool that came out a few years ago right 20 that's a pretty that feels so old to me now <laughs> that's like <laughs> i can't even listen you know when you put something out then you can never listen to it again i i i still play those pieces periodically mm -hmm. if it's, i guess it's i don't even know how many years old now it came out in like 20, what, 14? No, wow. 2013? I don't know. <laughs> I have no concept of time. Yes, yeah, so like a very, a very <laughs> different, a very different uh, era in your life. Uh, certainly, yes. yeah, yeah. And it was, I mean, that's all other people's music, right? Too. So, so it's different from 
mostly everything that I'm doing now. <laughs> but I, it's a, it's a really, those pieces are so good, mm -hmm. and um, I'm really happy that they exist and are in the repertoire now. Buying a double bass is a challenge for sure, and it's not getting any easier. That's why it's so great that Colsteins is offering interest-free financing and in select instruments, bows, and instrument repair purchases. Learn more at Colstein.com, and while you're there, check out their wonderful selection of pedigree instruments and bows and everything else that they have to offer. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. When you've built a reputation like Upton Bass has, the stakes are so high when you send out an instrument to a new owner. When people open that crate, man, the bar is so high. It doesn't matter if it's a $2,000 laminate base or it's a $20,000 one-off. The bar is so high. Maybe because of the amount of time we've been doing it, the awards on the wall, the gossip, the reputation, the marketing. But by the time they're opening their crate, they are invested so much into us. They are expecting the world and, and we have to meet that expectation every single time. That's Eric Roy of Upton Bass, and boy, do they meet those expectations that people set. Yes, the bar is high, but it's high because of the quality of work they've done over the years. They stand behind their products, and they have so many loyal fans, including me. Check them out at UptonBass.com, and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. They're very cool, and, and I, I saw a video of you doing one for maybe three years ago, I think Infest or something like that. You were playing home, oh, and yeah. you had your computers around you, and like, what am I, what, I, I'm a, a kind of like an amateur electronic music enthusiast. I do use Ableton mm -hmm. Live, and I play around with all sorts of, I, I spend way too much money on gear and just, you know, mess around with stuff. Like, what what am I seeing you doing there with your, the MacBooks around you and everything, Can like, like in a live performance of home or... But it could be anything like what what are you using up there besides the double bass like software wise hardware wise well so i'm just using i'm using tools that are kind of very basic tools of of the contemporary music arsenal mm -hmm. um and so i have one piece uh that was this is the title track on that album which yeah. was written for me by jenny olivia johnson and that utilizes uh, just guitar pedals. Um, and so it's just delay and distortion um, and then the acoustic signal. So that one, there's no software or anything. There's no click. Um, and then for some of the other pieces, like uh, Florent Gis wrote me a piece called uh, Crocodile, which uses... Um, I, I pre-recorded and multi-tracked myself, and then I play live uh, with that and a um, snippet from a documentary from um, a TV station in France. Um, and I'm singing, I pre-recorded and multi-tracked my voice and I sing live with that. And so to, to line that up, you have to use a click track. Mm -hmm. So I just have, um, I have the, uh, backing tracks and a click track routed to two separate channels for live performance. And that's how I play that. And then for Angelica Negron's piece, um, it's a similar setup, but I, um, I just have uh, an electronics track that she created and then uh, a click. So I route those two things and then I sing and play live cool. on top of that. Okay. Wow. Uh, and, and um, so this is a project from a few years ago, but uh, these days, and I know you've got the hands free, at least up on your website. I was reading yeah. about that and checking that out. That's very cool. And that's still ongoing. Oh yeah. We cool. have some shows okay. coming up um, nice. and we're always writing new stuff. Um, and that's one of my favorite projects for sure i love those guys they're all good friends and excellent musicians um and actually nathan cosey who's the accordion player in the hands free is the music director on oklahoma um so there's a little bit of an all in the family vibe there as well <laughs> <laughs> so so um you've been doing oklahoma uh 
st- uh, uh, since 2014? Like, has that been yep. ongoing since then? Okay, so that's a lot of years of of anything. Um, sure. And I've I, I think the I've maxed out at maybe 160 Nutcrackers. That's probably the most I've ever played of anything, which was uh, felt like a lot of Nutcrackers. But um, mm-hmm. like that that experience of being in the pit doing that like how do you how do you how's pit life oh. for you well we're we're actually not in a pit oh, i mean we are the... but we're we're on stage oh we're you're on stage show. oh cool well it's yeah so it's a different experience but still like like doing a show that long um I remember I did for I have so much less experience in this world but I do remember doing forever plaid for like a year um, mm-hmm. and at a certain point I thought I'm kind of sick of this show. And then I, I went beyond that point and it was just like sort of yep. my life. <laughs> and then it became very fascinating when something was different. Like if we had a, uh, a different plaid, one of the guys got subbed in or if the audience had a funny vibe or something like that. So just like, what's that experience like, um, which seems very different from a lot of the other things you do musically, but just like doing the same show for a, uh, a period of many years what's that been like well every time we've done it um you know every time we've mounted a new version of it it has been slightly different but uh we've now been we basically went from doing it at st ann's warehouse to broadway almost immediately so we've been doing it for over a year straight and that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows um and the things that sort of keep you going are the music which is just so good yeah. that i could just i mean i have kept playing it forever and ever, <laughs> um, because it's just so good and fulfilling from a musical perspective and then i i really firmly believe that this production is e- extremely important um from a social and political standpoint um mm-hmm. right now and um it uh, so i i believe in the work we're doing i think the work is important and i think it's a a vital piece of art and i think daniel fish has got something he touched a nerve with it and i think that's why people have kept you know coming back and liking it so much is that it's yeah. it's a valuable piece of art at this particular time in our country um and Yes, when you start to do hundreds and hundreds of shows, there's a certain amount of extemporizing that happens on stage, both with the actors and with the the musicians. We're all part of this uh, world on stage with the audience. It's a semi semi immersive <laughs> production, um, and so the audience and the cast and band are all kind of part of this construct together. And so when any one of those three elements uh changes slightly it it makes the whole show slightly different so no two shows are alike they're snowflakes if you will um and we have such a a rapport with the actors that we're always kind of improvising with them on stage and we have little things we do and you know within the musical framework there's a lot of improvising happening as well so um it's it's a little different from I think other Broadway productions in that way. Yeah, sounds uh, like it. That's cool. Yeah. Um. So with that, uh, with that closing, right, right. Yes. Uh, what's so like? What's maybe this year gonna look like for you, or what? What else is on your plate? What do you want to have on your plate? Um. I'm, I'm sure that takes a that sure changes the schedule. Not doing that. Um. I would imagine. Yes, that will be that will be a welcome rest. <laughs> it's a lot eight, of commutes. Eight shows a week. Well, eight shows a week of a three-hour show Whoa. where I am in cowboy boots, physically exerting myself the whole time. <laughs> going to be my body is going to be happy that's for sure. Um, although I have to say, this is a short advertisement for yoga and distance barefoot running. People. Really? If you practice natural running and or yoga, you can get through just about any. Um, this has been brought to you by no one. Um, the the things on my plate for the coming year are um, more hands free stuff. Yeah. Um, I have a uh, a version, a, an acoustic trio version of Glasser that you maybe saw on my website. I don't know, my website's pretty out of date, but 
um, we're working on some stuff there and a couple albums coming out with that. And then I have a duo project with my dear friend and um, musical uh, brain mate, uh, Jesse Montgomery, called Big Dog, Little Dog. It's violin and bass, and we uh, are working on some new material. Uh, we have an album that came out not too long ago. Um, but we're working on some new stuff, uh, a few little film things here and there. Um, and, uh, then the usual assortment of other stuff that I do, like new music stuff and, uh, various other things. Well, it'll be, it'll be fun to see how that all plugs into the, that's like a giant uh, chunk of time that, that you're going to have that you didn't have <laughs> in terms of, exactly. Uh, so that'll be, that'll be exciting. Yeah. What? I'm looking forward to having more time to write. <laughs> and, and actually I'd love to add, I'm always fascinated. I don't really, com I arrange a little, I don't really compose, but I'm always interested by people who do like, how do you write? Do you write at the bass? Do you write at the piano? Do you walk around and sing things into your phone? Do you th th sit down at Sibelius or finale or sheet music or all of the above or none of the above? Like what, what do you do? Uh, what's your creative process like when you're writing? It depends on what it is that I'm writing for. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely never sit down and write something with a pen and paper or on finale. That's yeah. definitely not something I ever do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Usually <laughs> it depends on like what it is. So Jesse and I, when we write big dog, little dog stuff, we go into a room, we turn on our voice memo and we improvise uh, completely freely and then later on, we go back, get the nuggets out of that. We sort of pan for musical gold. And then we take those little nuggets and we polish them and build, you know, build them into a, a form and, and make them into something. Um, and then when I'm writing by myself, um, I, depending on what it's for, you know, I might sometimes write it at the base or I might, you know, sing or I might write at a guitar or a mandolin. I almost never use the piano because I'm a terrible pianist. Right, sure. Um, and <laughs> so it's usually like, if it's going to be a chord instrument, it's usually guitar or mando. Um, um, and, you know, I my thing is like, sometimes I'll get uh, like a little fragment of something into my head and then I kind of expand on that um, or sing it out or play it out or, you know, so it's usually an improvisational process for me. Um, and it just kind of comes to me and then I polish it later. How do you find, how have you found time for that over these years with Oklahoma and everything else? Do you do it in the morning? Do you do it after shows on breaks or when I did... get, yeah, I mean, I get most of my good work done in the morning. Um, which is something I discovered about myself like stupidly recently. <laughs> I always <laughs> thought I was a night owl. And then it turns out I actually am way more functional in the morning than yep. I thought. <laughs> so I try to, I mean, if you're going to, if you want to do something, you have to make time to do it. It's yeah. not going to come to you. So you just carve out a little time. And then, you know, i like right in my I've I've written and recorded things in my dressing room. <laughs> like, oh wow. I had I wrote a little film music for something a couple weeks ago and I was literally in my dressing room at Oklahoma like writing and recording it. <laughs> so cool. you just find you find time and space wherever you can. <laughs> Eleanor, thank you for chatting. Krista, thank you for the suggestion. EleanorOppenheim.com is her website. And we've got social media and all that good stuff linked up as well. 
I love getting suggestions from guests. This was an e- example of one <laughs> from somebody I, I know well through the podcast, Krista, but I said, oh, this person seems awesome. Connect, chat, boom, there it is. Sometimes it takes longer. People do reach out and give me suggestions and I keep a list that turn into a spreadsheet and then it turned into another list and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but, but I go through that and comb through it and get inspired. And uh, my hope before I die is <laughs> to connect with everybody on that spreadsheet. You know, I used to think back when I started this podcast that I would run out of people to talk with. Uh, it, experience has shown me that that will never be the case. I could connect with somebody new every single day and never run out of people ever. And even with two episodes a week, which is a lot for a podcast, uh, I'm never even going to scratch the surface of interesting people to talk with. And it's good to have people back multiple times. So Danny Zeman or Diego Zacharias or Andres Martin or you name it, the person who's been on multiple times. I'm, I'm chatting with Valentina Ciardelli again for the third time <laughs> in like a year and a half. Uh, but she keeps doing cool projects. So I, that is a very long way of saying that uh, it's just exciting for me to connect with these people. And I love the community aspect of people uh, suggesting uh, folks that they'd like to have on the podcast. And then I love the self-improvement exercise that this is. This is, by the way, this is a selfish project, <laughs> uh, this podcast, although I love that people are following along with it. But I feel like it's one of those things that's good for me, like going to the gym or eating healthy or reading a uh, uh, a useful book, you know, things, maybe I want to do them, maybe I don't want to do them, but they really help me. And I'll tell you, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm very loopy here, by the way. I've recorded, this is my eighth podcast intro or outro that I've recorded today. I've been sitting in front of this stinking laptop for like 90 minutes or something ridiculous uh, doing these. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to just go off, not that I have a script, but I'm just going to go off script and, and uh, babble for a minute. So uh, a lot of you will not be listening at this point anyway, but the diehard fans are listening. So hey, diehard fans uh, and people who can't press stop for whatever reason. Um, so a lot of the time, I'd say over half of the time, I look on my calendar and I think, oh, I don't want to talk to somebody on Skype or I don't want to, uh, I don't want to drive over there and chat. And even though I love doing this, I have that kind of feeling. You know, you have that feeling when you want to go, when you know you should go to the gym. I'm sure a lot of you can relate and you don't want to go to the gym, but then you go to the gym and about it's five, 10 minutes in. You're like, yes, this is what I should be doing. This is great. Why would I ever not want to do that? Well, I feel that way with the podcast a lot, even though I love it. And every time, every time, maybe a couple times now, but pretty much every time I get done. And I think that was the best possible use of my time was chatting with this person and learning about them and just the simple act of having a conversation and trying to be better at having a conversation, which is harder than you think. If you think about it, listening and not interrupting and not talking over somebody and, and really absorbing what they're talking about. And also, uh, if you're doing a show like this, kind of maybe directing the conversation a little bit, but also having the, the openness to go in a direction you might not have thought of. There is so much in this sort of art form if we want to elevate it to that, which I think I think it is an art form um, that has parallels to improvisation and jazz or uh, or other things like that. And so I leave these podcast chats uh, a better person than when I started them. And then I have all this material, so to talk to somebody, but then there is the art form of trying to tell their story. Not that that sounds pretentious. They told their story, but what do I write for the show notes? That seems simple, but it takes forever. Um, what do I say in this intro and outro? That seems simple, but it takes forever. And, and uh, but but when I'm done with all, and, and ugh, like today, this is, this is always like the dark day of my month is like, like doing all these intros and outros and the images and the blah, blah, blah. But, um, but, but, but when I'm done, I think, okay, that was actually really cool. And it's, I, I know that it is a good self-improvement exercise for me as well. 
Wow, I just overshared there. But uh, there it is. <laughs> That's what happens when I get to the end of these chests. And one more thing, since I'm massively oversharing here, uh, I, I've, I've gone into this, this rhythm that it's the only way that this podcast can exist for me, where I, there is no podcast for me, and then it's all podcast for like a day or two. So I interview people in these massive batches. Either it's a trip to Australia or something like that, or if it's remote, I sit down and I chat on Skype or FaceTime or Facebook Messenger with people for like five hours. And then I don't do it for a month um, because I just have a busy life and I'm doing other things. And I can't, it's like a death by a thousand cuts if I try to do them every week or something like that. So though you're hearing them every week, you're really hearing from me once a month, which might be why things seem a little bit strangely uh, placed if we're talking about like October and it's January. Well, that's how it works. Uh, you're hearing the sausage being made here. <laughs> and then... Um, I also only do these intros and outros and write the show notes and stuff like once a month. So, you know, think about not practicing bass for a month or whatever instrument you play, probably bass, but, and then practicing. Feels terrible, right? Or not working out for a month and then working out. Feels terrible, right? So the first couple, uh, I'm like, oh, like I even forget how to do them. Like I think the first one I did today, I gave this intro, not that any of you probably notice or care, but but I care. Um, I gave this intro that I used to do like back in 2007. I just sort of forgot how I do the podcast intros, which again, more sausage being made. I I learned this from talk show hosts. What you don't want to do, uh, tips for people maybe starting a podcast, don't say their name right away. This again, maybe this is stupid, but this is what talk show people do. So I say, my guest, blah, 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 they are doing this and this. It's so exciting. And then I say my name and the show's name, Jason Heath, Controversy Conversations, the guest's name. I used to always say the guest's name and I'd say it like multiple times. And it's just, it, you're, even though it's, this might seem cheesy and this might not even actually work that well for a podcast, Yet it's what I do. I I give a little bit of like a quasi teaser. Talk about who that person is. You've heard a quote from them, right? Ooh, who is this person? Now, if you look at the title, you'll know. But if you're just in the car or at the gym or whatever, and the next podcast is coming on, you hear this person you may not know. You hear me kind of build it up, and then boom, name reveal. So anyway, I forget how to how I even do that or the intros or outros. And then after I do them for a while, I start to feel like I'm in a groove, and I'm like, oh yeah, I kind of like doing this. Then I get to the point like I am right now where I hate doing them because I'm, I'm, I'm burned out and I start to make dumb mistakes and my throat's getting dry. I need to keep drinking water. Then I have to keep going to the bathroom because I'm drinking so much water and I'm looking at the clock thinking of all the things I wanted to do today, but it's already 1243 PM. And so that's sort of all my creative time is burned. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting. I don't know why I'm telling you this story, but uh, I, I, I just routines and rhythms. And I don't know. I think it's interesting to be transparent. So that's how this podcast seems to work for me now. It's it's all about batches. And I do that with other projects in my life too. I, I do find that I get the most done by... Rather than trying to do like five different things uh, in a day, I'll maybe try to do one thing for three hours and maybe one thing that's not as cognitive, co co can't even talk, cognitively demanding for like uh, an hour or something like that, and then do some bass practice at the end. That's sort of the rhythm that I have found. So, wow. Sorry, Eleanor. I totally overshared at the end of your episode, but I love connecting with Eleanor. I love connecting with everybody. Thank you for listening. If you made it through this nine, nearly, I'm looking at at my timer, nearly nine minute diatribe at the end, for no reason, except I'm, I'm loopy at the end of this podcast. Thank you. You are a true fan. And thank you also, uh, get into my traditional closer here, to the Contrabase Conversations team, Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Mitch Mooring, Trevor Jones, Krista Copper. Thanks for the suggestion for today's guest, Krista. Thank you for your podcast, The Backstage Creative, in addition to what you do for this podcast. Thank you to Mitch Mooring. Check out his bases at mitchmooring.com. And uh, yeah, wow. I'm your host, Jason Heath, talking way too much here on this podcast, but thanks for listening. If you made it this far, wow. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I truly uh, appreciate it. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Spectrum.